Is it recording yet for you? Yeah, it is. Perfect. <laughs> it's still loading on my side. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, May 5th uh, Parker Office Hours. Um, we have a couple of exciting things to share. Um, probably most of you have seen the announcement of Arctic TV. Um, and then later on, we'll have a new government that we put in place earlier today uh, that Kemal kind of worked on, but he won't be able to make it. So we're gonna gonna talk you through that one. Um, but yeah, I, I think Arctic TV announcement went pretty great yesterday. Been kind of like the bus, the hype was real. And yeah, let's learn about what, what it means uh, for Parker or in general, what, what Arctic TV is. Um, I think it says you on the agenda, Frederick, if you want to take it away. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> both of you have been on the call here while we've uh, also been developing this and we've mentioned it a couple of times. So I guess I'll, I'll just uh, kind of give a little bit of a summary um, for the recording. Um, otherwise, uh, if anyone after maybe watching this uh, on YouTube, um, if there are any questions, please feel free to jump into our Discord. Um, it's linked uh, on the parker.dev website. Um, if you have any questions, we're more than happy to talk uh, talk about, explain anything else. But on a high level, um, the column store that we've built um, is essentially what holds all of the sample data for um, Parker going forward. And part of the reason why column stores are good for this um, or why we went down this route is because we want to be able to uh, um, essentially attach unbound cardinality data um, to these samples so that we can differentiate on any dimension um, we could possibly think of. But just a few that uh, kind of come to mind that we think could be really useful are things like tr uh, distributed tracing ID or even a distributed tracing span ID so that we can kind of look at how, how much CPU time did an entire request um, kind of cause versus maybe an, a, a single function or a single span within that um, trace. Uh, but those are really only some of the p possible um, applications. It, it, it's it's arbitrary, right? Like the uh, any kind of metadata, any kind of labels could be attached uh, to this to this uh, to profiling data to be useful, and um, that can be you know arbitrary things that are custom to your code. It could be. Uh, customer XYZ cost, um, the CPU time or th things like that. Um, and just being able to add any uh, kind of dimension like that allows us to slice and dice this data to truly understand what's going on. And so we, we had our previous kind of time series database style um, storage, which I won't go, go into too many uh, details here, but like read the um, announcement blog post to read why that didn't work out with these requirements that, that I just I was just talking about. Um, but yeah, essentially column stores are really great at handling super high cardinality because we pay essentially the same cost per row um, and not per cardinality. Um, so ultimately that means if we can get the cost per row super low, that means ultimately we can actually deal with high cardinality data. That's kind of the the, the high level idea. Um, and yeah, we, we open sourced the, um, the column store under the name uh, ArcticDB uh, yesterday. And yeah, I, as we kind of alluded to in the announcement blog post as well, this is really just the start, but it's already Quite capable of using of handling uh, profiling data, but yeah, there's there's so much uh, left to do. Like, we're um, there. There are so many optimized query optimizations that we uh, have yet to do. 
there's still no persistence. So everything that we do is in memory. We buffer it up to a certain size and then kind of throw it all away and start over again. Obviously, this is not um, desirable for the long term, but it's kind of okay right now while we'll, we're still kind of super heavily developing the underlying format and things like that. And the like the learnings we've had in the past with Prometheus and other uh, kind of projects like that um, is the moment we write things on disk, people start to depend on that state being stable. And so that's why we're being extra careful with um, like writing disk, uh, writing writing data to disk um, kind of prematurely. So yeah, um, that was that was the announcement. Definitely super excited to have finally kind of publicly talked about it. I know uh, folks in this call um, have probably already uh, seen it. Some of you even uh, contributed to it, but um, I think it's cool that we're um, we finally were able to talk about it publicly and, you know, <laughs> nice bonus. It was, seems to have been received really well, um, by the community. So, so that's really cool to see. I'll stop here and, um, ask or give, give space, give room, uh, for any questions that anyone, anyone might have also happy to dive into any like detailed, uh, you might be interested in or just anything or it can be high level it can be strategy whatever whatever you're interested in um i i just wanted to say that uh, congratulations for the work um it's it's an it's really an awesome project i have been following your work uh, for weeks right now and uh, i i'm just amazed uh the, that the intensity of the work you have uh, actually written a database from scratch so it's just con just congratulations that's all <laughs> thank you uh i i do have to reiterate also i i do think this is really cool and i think the team um has done an amazing job but i do need to reiterate also on the like help kind of that we got uh from the community here right like we wouldn't have been able to do this without the really incredible parquet library that the folks at segment um, open source, um, the Apache Arrow libraries, of course, uh, they're, they're a big deal. Um, and also several individuals who've kind of helped us, advised us uh, on this journey. And uh, yeah, I don't think the quality of the project would be where it's at if it wasn't for all of those things. So, but still, thank you. I also think um, this was a tremendous amount of work and a complex um, piece of work. Uh, so yeah, I'm 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 proud of everyone involved. Uh, I haven't gone through the blog post yet. Uh, I will, um, but can you give me an overview of how cardinality is different, as in what cardinality is and how it's different between Ruby's versus columnar based databases? Yeah, that's a really good, uh, really good question. So, card cardinality can overall just be described as like the um, unique um, kind of combinations of, of data. And um, in Prometheus, the way that kind of manifests itself is when you have a, a unique set of labels, right? So like namespace A pod B uh, container C, that is uh, like cardinality one. Now, what, if you then have another um, container in that pod, then you have a cardinality of two, right? Um, and so on. Uh, every, every, and every time you add more variability in those labels, you add in cardinality. And cardinality can be a wonderful thing and it can be a um, terrible thing. <laughs> like. Um, it, it kind of depends on what your goals are and what the capabilities of the, um, of the system are. So in, in Prometheus, you essentially pay per, um, like in Prometheus with the cardinality, um, creates a time series. So every cardinality that you have, um, means that Prometheus is now tracking in memory, 
a series of values. Um, and this is great when you have, you know, Prometheus can handle a surpri surprising amount of cardinality, but um, it, it does mean that every time we add more cardinality, we're paying a very, very big price for that cardinality because series overhead is essentially kind of the worst thing uh, for Prometheus memory usage. Um, again, as I also kind of said in the, in the blog post, this is not a bad thing. Prometheus was designed to be that way. Um, but we intentionally set out to um, not be limited in cardinality in any way. That's the whole reason why we went on this journey of building this database. And um, it, it's not really an apples to apples kind of comparison because we don't have an equivalent of a series of, um, uh, of time series. In um, Arctic DB, we pay per row. And we can minimize the, um, we can have any kind of variability in that row, right? So that essentially allows us to have unbound cardinality. And we just, quote unquote, just need to get the cost per row as far down as we possibly can, right? And that's why we have all of these uh, different kinds of encodings that help us store each column as efficient as we possibly can. So if we do have um, recurring values, we use uh, the run length encode dictionary one run length encoding. So first, what we do is we essentially deduplicate the strings and give each string an integer. And then whenever we see that string again, um, or when, whenever we that see, we see that string, we just assign that um, integer. And if we see that integer again, we just say, okay, we, we, we just see this integer twice. We don't actually write another row value for it. We just say we've seen it multiple times. So that's just one of the encodings uh, that make this kind of thing uh, really efficient. There are, there are various other encodings and um, compression algorithms that ultimately help drive down the cost per row more and more. And then um, to get um, a query latency that is acceptable. Um, we also did a couple needed to do a couple of tricks, and this doesn't really have to do anything with a column store per se, but we um, store the data in a in a specific order so that um, duplicate values are more likely to be at, um, one after another. So that means a run length encoding, for example, has maximum efficiency. Um, but not only that, it also allows us to, um, sorry, um, it allows us to, scan through this data much more efficiently, right? Like, um, if we, if we have, um, a column that says, I'm going to see this value a hundred times now. Um, then we can either, you know, say, yes, all of these values that are going to come now are going to be relevant, or we can just skip over them and say, all of this data doesn't matter. We can just skip to the end of it, um, and we can continue there. So there, there are a bunch of tricks that we applied so that, um, we kind of get the, um, speed of a time series database while not having to pay the price of one. And again, it's not really an apples to apples comparison. So it's kind of, it's not fair to necessarily say that, but we're getting close to various, uh, various um, like details of characteristics of a time series database. Yeah, I think I just want to add that basically like in in time series databases and in, in, in Prometheus, you you also like with the cardinality issues, you have like series churn, so like new containers showing up and going, um, that kind of like uh, really um, makes makes the entire thing even worse. And then what what we also kind of like saw was that for any 
profile where we only see a stack trace once, we still had to somewhat have a time series per like for that single stack trace that we just saw once basically. So that also kind of like really uh, made the entire meta worse. So now if we if we see a stack trace once, we write one row uh, into the columnar store. And if we see a stack trace a hundred times, we just write a hundred rows into the columnar store. And the overhead of, of kind of like, you, you can think of it as nested maps. So you have like a map of all the labels and then uh, you map to all the stack traces in the in the old time series database and then from there you had to track like individual time series and all of that is gone like the overhead of kind of like um navigating to to the place where the time series was uh located in memory all of that is, is kind of gone and yeah like tracking um stack traces will be kind of like yeah will be will, will have less overhead uh for for things that aren't seen as often while still uh, run length encoding is super close to what we had uh, in Prometheus as well and in and, and Parker then. Um, so yeah, kind of a good trade-off, a really good trade-off for Parker, I think. Thanks. I look to dive into the blog and read some. Yeah, this is the blog, <laughs> if that wasn't too obvious. As a kind of, um, for, foreshadowing, <laughs> uh, we already did a, a really small um, proof of concept where we um, tested being able to like adding the ability to query by like profiling labels into the query language. And this does already work. And the, the beautiful thing about all of this is that we get the same kind of, or maybe even better performance characteristics because we can so quickly search for these things um, using the sorted data. Um, and so, yeah, um, basically what that means is even though this is a really, really early proof of concept, it's probably gonna take weeks if not months to actually make it into um, Parka. But the point is we've kind of unlocked all of this potential and that we can now continue to exploit. Um, one question, Frederick. So I, I was just uh, looking at the uh, latest blog post and I was comparing with the RFC that you have uh, shared a while ago. Uh, in the RFC, I, I saw that um, uh, you, are, you were using um, unique identifier for uh, array of unique identifiers for storing the stack trace and the, did it change? Uh, and is there a reason for that or? Um. No, I, I just did that for clarity in the blog post. Oh, okay. um, I, I felt like it, was, it wasn't worth going into um, like the way that we make storing these things more efficient or you know, nitty gritty details of why we need to deduplicate location IDs or stuff like that. Totally makes sense. So you keep Metastore out of equation, probably. Yeah. Yes, for this blog post, we kept it out of the equation, <laughs> but yeah, the, it's still just as important. Yeah, the the Metastore is super important for for Parka. It's a component of Parka, whereas ArcticDB is kind of like a columnar store that doesn't even care about that. Apparently, there's something like a Metastore that stores like UIDs for stack traces. It's completely oblivious to that. So I think, yeah, kind of tra trade off. And I think, yeah, having having the full names in the blog post, like so, kind of made it clear as well. Totally makes sense. And one one more question is that um, is there any change that you have? I, I know that you have been implementing um, indexes using granules, like that kind of stuff. So. Um, is there any improvement on that as well? And um, I just heard or just um, read yesterday that you were going to implement full text search with Bloom filters. I'm really interested in that stuff as well. So maybe you could talk a little bit on that, or maybe you don't. You just don't want to. I don't know. Yeah. No. Um, I, I, I'll I'll say. <laughs> as much as we've thought about it. <laughs> some of this is still, you know, some th things that we're actively thinking about and we just don't know for sure. Like most of these things are also just 
we don't know the answers. We're we're just, you know, we do the back of the envelope math and everything, but only once you actually implement it do you know whether it's actually going to work out. Um, uh, let's see. So let's start with the granule index. So yeah, this is still an area that we're actively working on. Actually, Thor has a pull request open that improves some of this, um, where we essentially add, like we maintain some additional metadata um, from the, uh, like outside of the parquet buffers that we uh, keep in memory. Um, and we do this to be able to say um, and have in the B tree only the um, kind of ranges that these granules um, cover. And the reason why this is important is so that we can say, um, you can skip that, that we can just, yeah, exactly. We can just skip, skip through it essentially. And because it's a B tree, we can actually do more than just skip over individual ones. We can kind of walk the tree up again and then walk the tree down again in a more efficient way than just um, iterating to the next element. That's like at least the idea. This kind of tree walking, uh, we haven't implemented yet, but we're kind of getting getting there by like one, one step at a time. <laughs> mm. And um, the, the last thing that you mentioned about um, full text searching. So this is this is only confined to um, data or, or function names, essentially. So th that's the the only place where we think it's useful to be able to you know just kind of start typing, and um, Parker would tell you, okay, this is kind of a function that. I'm aware of uh, that you can search by that would make sense, right? Um, it's possible that we don't know what the right answer is in terms of what um, mechanism there we should be using for indexing itself. Um, but we think that feature is a useful one to have. So this could be implement implementation wise, this could be using an actual full text search engine like Believe or Blev, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce it. Um, my personal gut feeling about that is it's probably much too heavy of a solution for what we're looking for. It's meant for like indexing giant documents, right? Like books. <laughs> um, whereas we're, we're talking about like strings that if we're, if we're being generous have like a thousand bytes, right? And that, I think that's kind of wild. Like most function names are maybe less than 20 characters or something like that. So um, it's possible that maybe we'll just implement something much more simple, like a trigram index. Um, I, but on the other hand, we've already built one database. I'm not sure I want to build another one. <laughs> um, even if it's fun, at the end of the day, we, we need to kind of weigh off um, whether like there, there's actually a need for innovation or, um, you know, maybe, maybe like something like blev or bleep again, I don't know how to pronounce it, but uh, maybe that's enough, even if it's a bit of an overkill. And yeah, kind of to differentiate this would be a feature of Parka and not Arctic DB. <laughs> Just want to ma make sure that the distinction is clear. Um, I mean, we are in a Parker office hour call, but we've just been talking about Arctic so much. Yep. The, it, it's possible that maybe we'll have something like trigram indexes indices in like Arctic DB as well, right? But um, I think it would be a long shot saying that that will actually happen. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I think we're just not at the point where we can, where we're even experimenting with this, right? Like no one's even done an experiment on this. So, yeah, I, I, th I think I'd be I'd be interested to see how much like an index from Blev looks, um, like how how large an index from Blev is um, using like I don't know, 
10 or 100 node cluster or something. I, I completely agree that it's too, it's maybe a little bit early to discuss this, but uh, just my two cents. Um, it would be extremely useful from users' point of view when if you just, for example, implemented a function and go after two weeks, just type that in and see the CPU consumption, memory consumption, whatever. I mean, it's it's really, it might be really useful in the end. Could not agree more. Uh, like I, I find myself wanting to do this all the time, right? Which is I, which is why I think uh, this is super useful. Um, and yeah, I, we'll, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> Maybe there's so much motivation in the room that someone exactly dog fooding is actually happening for Park, right? Most yeah. Of <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think actually <laughs> about all of this, I think the query language part is going to be the most difficult one. Like, I think the indexing part, there's enough precedence that we could use something off the shelf, even if it's not the most um, optimal right now. I think like writing, designing and implementing the query languages, I think much more intricate than searching. Well, again, only because searching is kind of a solved problem, not because searching is easy. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I guess we can, in that vein, if people are super highly motivated, talk about our new open governance. <laughs> uh, kind of a segue there. So yeah, like, um, we just earlier today, uh, maybe I'll share my screen again. Um, we put this, um, this new government into place. And uh, if you ever seen the Prometheus governance, it really is that uh, we took a lot of inspiration from Prometheus governance and, and put it into Parker. Um, for a matter of fact, we, I think, did the same for Thanos. So we're kind of used to that governance and it, it really worked well. Um, so yeah, like um, we have like decision-making, um, you need to, to uh, have uh, ongoing contributions to the Parker projects for three months. And then um, somebody can propose a new member um, to, to be added to the team. Um, and all of that is done by uh, email groups, uh, Google groups, um, where the team has a, a group and then there is a somewhere, uh, yeah, the developers mailing list as well. So we have two mailing lists, but the voting and kind of like internal uh, team communication will happen on the on the non-public non uh, Parker team. And then everybody can kind of chime in, ask questions uh, on the developers mailing list. Um, and yeah, you can see the, the current uh, team members of Parker, which isn't really that diverse. So contributions are very welcome. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Um, we need, yeah, for like, we, we have like lazy consensus. So I think it's like, um, if you don't agree um, in a certain time, you kind of like, um, automatically uh, accept what has been proposed. Um, and then for some, there's a super majority vote. I think that needs two thirds to agree to something. If I remember correctly. Um, but yeah, everything's written down kind of overall, the idea is Parker is an open source project, but what we've come to, to really learn is that it's not even so much about the, the code and the, the code being open. But in the end, it's also about the open community, about the open team, open collaboration. Um, and that is so much more than, than just the code. Um, so yeah, that's why we put, put this into place earlier today. And yeah, we would love to get feedback and obviously get contributions and eventually add new team members if, if there's uh, interest. Any, any questions on any of it? anything to add all right um 
but yeah, always feel free to write an email to the to the mailing list. I think we uh, everybody can write to the team member list from the outside. So if you want to contact the team kind of privately, that's fine. But obviously, we also still have Discord if you want to ask questions kind of off the shelf without being as formal um, about the the governance. Um, and I think overall that's everything on the agenda. I don't know if we I should have like an open QA where people can can ask other related and related questions, I guess. Related to Parker, please. <laughs> but yeah. Um any anything you wanna ask? Now's the time. Anything else unrelated to to Arctic TV, maybe overall to where the project's heading or things in terms of user experience you want to see improved in in Parka that you are kind of like missing. I guess we've discussed the you want to search for function names, but maybe there's something else. So I saw that ArcDB is organized, uh, is owned by Polar Single instead of Parka. So what was the reasoning behind that? Really good question. Um, yeah, Frederick, you want to mute yourself. <laughs> Uh, if you want to take it, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, so that that was intentional in the way that we wanted to uh, emphasize that Arctic DB is not just about continuous profiling. It it is a column store that we think is useful for all sorts of observability type use cases. Maybe maybe it could even be broader described as any type of um you know write only workload or like append only workloads um so yeah we we wanted to be intentional about um not binding it just to the parka project and as a matter of fact i actually got a couple of messages over overnight um where people were like hey this actually looks super useful for this thing where i want to stuff some very specific observability data into a store where like existing open source tools don't work for me. So I, like, I'm happy to, I was happy to see that because that was exactly um, why we chose to do, um, just to do it like that. Yeah, it already has over 200 stars. So it looks to be going strong. Yeah, it did pretty well. <laughs> Yeah, that's why like I, I didn't take the stars. <laughs> I think before before we published the blog post, uh, blog post yesterday it was like exactly two hundred less. <laughs> Actually, now that you mention this, I've been checking like GitHub trending all day, and it's not showing up, and I don't understand why. Mm. Maybe it needs to continue for one or two days, and then then it Maybe. does. I don't know. Yeah. It should. It should it keep scrolling. The the amount of stars is much higher than um than other projects on trending right now. I don't know. Just FOMO, but <laughs> I don't really understand because they very specifically point out the number of stars that were uh that it got over the last um day or so. So anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Good question. Uh, anything else? All right. Then I would say, actually, I don't think we will have the one in two weeks because that's exactly KubeCon. Uh, if you can make it to KubeCon, we can talk in person. <laughs> that would be easier. But if you can't make it to KubeCon, we will be back in a month. Uh, so beginning of June, I guess. Um, and yeah, otherwise keep in touch on Twitter, on Discord, um, or even write to the new mailing lists, uh, which I need to subscribe to right after this call, I, I, I guess. <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't see the emails. All right. Um, but yeah, keep in touch and, and see you in a month uh, on this call and maybe see you in, in Valencia for KubeCon. Thank you so much. 
Thanks for coming. Take care. Bye. 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 B